Hello, welcome back. Mike from Canavan Wealth. Today we are talking about this question. When do you go to cash? I've always been a thinker. Uh, back in college, I got my degrees in engineering, but I got minor in philosophy, mostly philosophy of science and religion. Uh, and, and I've always just been one to think a lot. I like to consider myself fairly well informed. And if you want to know the one thing that haunts me, that keeps me up at night, it is the answer to this question which is when do you go to cash? Because as I have gone through my you know, career, I have worked with a number of very good financial advisors uh, and all of the ones that I have seen be successful, that I think do great jobs for their clients. The answer that I always get for this is never, right? Which is trying to get in and out of the market is a fool's errand. You will never be successful at it. Or you might be successful at it once, but you will not be able to repeat it. As, as one of them has often told me, it's not good enough to be right once. You have to be right twice, which is not only when do you get out, but when do you get back in, which is a whole other question. But I often think, well, if the answer is never, am I really doing my job for my clients? If the answer is I will never get out of the stock market, I'm not sure that's the best answer, right? Because I often then give them back the scenario. What about, let's say Independence Day happens, right? Our favorite movie from the late 90s, I'm guessing. Uh, aliens show up and they shoot a laser beam through the White House and London and Dallas. I don't know about you. I'm selling my accounts to cash if the aliens show up and they're intent on eradicating us, right? Uh, I don't think the stock market is going to make it through. Now, we could have a whole conversation about whether it matters, whether I sold your account to cash, if Independence Day truly happens. But even if we win, even if Will Smith comes and rescues us all, the, the global economy would collapse, right? The, the S&P 500, I think, in that scenario, which would you know go down like 80% and it would take decades, in my opinion, to recover. So in that scenario, I'd go to cash. So there's got to be something between you know, Independence Day and normal human activity, when would I get out of the market? I don't have an answer for you. There, there's not a conclusion slide for this. I want to go through two scenarios, though. One very recently is why I'm releasing this video, where I had this crisis of, of uh, kind of beliefs and like, do I really believe in this philosophy of you cannot time the market? It is a fool's errand. So let's go through the first one first, which is recently. Okay. So we are right in the middle. If uh, It is May 30th, depending on when you watch this. We have just recently gone through the debt ceiling crisis where at least the media wants you to think that we could default on debt, right? And, and if you watch my channel, you know, I like to consider myself at least very well informed. Not only do I read the Wall Street Journal, I read a lot of different news out. Uh, outlets and organizations, um, and I follow a lot of different economic you know, kind of news and what's going on with the market. So it was a week ago, the weekend a week ago, which would have been about May 20th, where the market had been up very strongly for two days. We were up at this trading band that we've been in. This band here was right here that we were for. We've been in this band for like two months now. And this was largely because, as I perceived at the time, that the markets were believing that a debt ceiling deal was coming, right? So I was like, okay, the markets assume that we're going to make it through this debt ceiling deal. Because the simple truth is, no matter who you talk to, if we defaulted on our debt, it would be catastrophic for the financial sector, right? Like the market would get crushed. Most people predict 2008 or possibly worse. And yet, in my opinion, we had already priced in that a deal had come, right? So even if there's only a five, let's say there's a 5% chance that we, not only do we not come to an agreement, but we then also default on our debt. So we're like, one of the things that I think the mislead, media has drastically misled the American public about is that just because we didn't sign, if we don't sign a debt deal by June 1st or June 5th now, that we will default on our debt. Now, we just have to pick someone not to pay. It doesn't mean that we're not going to pay you know, the people who own U.S. debt. We could not pay Social Security recipients, not very popular. Not pay the military, not very popular, right? 
there's there are things that we can just not pay. Remember back 2012, this happened, right? We didn't default on our debt. We just didn't like the military didn't get paid for like a month or something. I don't remember the exact details. Maybe it was a couple of weeks. So I'm like, the market has already priced in the fact that we're going to have an agreement, which means there's only downside, right? If we actually get the deal, I don't expect the market to go up. Maybe the market pops at most, I'm thinking 5%, which even to me seemed ludicrous. I'm like, it'll only be up like 1% or 2% because we still have the interest rate thing to figure out in July. So I'm thinking, okay, we're in a situation, best case scenario over the next, let's say month, is that the market goes up 5%. I think more like two in the short term, right? Over the next week or two. And the worst case scenario is, a 2008 like global financial crisis and the stock market drops 50% over the coming months. And I'm like, who in their right mind doesn't go to cash in this scenario? If you asked any one of my clients, are you willing to give up a two to 5% rise in your, in your account in order to avoid the possibility of it being halved? The answer is always, when you present it like that, the answer is always going to be, of course, right? Because most of my clients, although they want great returns, they understand that we are not chasing the absolute best returns because we're trying to provide some type of downside protection. Become much, much harder these days with, with the bond market the way it is. And... So, you know, I I come in Monday morning thinking like, am I crazy for not putting my accounts in cash, right? And then, of course, so this is Monday. We we closed largely even, which means I even had a day to do it. Now, I, you know, it is a very complicated process to put 150 households worth of uh, worth of accounts into cash. It is not, it is. I can do it at the press of a button, but I have to make sure I'm pressing the right button for all 150 households. You know, this is people's life savings. It is not a simple process to do this. And and I've always thought to myself, I think I could do most of it in a day and I can have it all done in two days, two trading days, right? Because I have to do it inside trading hours. Um, There's there's a lot of complications that I'm not going to go into. People don't understand that it's a substantial effort to put things in cash. I would absolutely go through it if I felt like it was necessary. So I even had the chance to do it here, right? Now, Tuesday was this big down day. Wednesday was another big down day, right? And here I am Wednesday. I'm thinking like, yeah, I should have done it. Like, because all the news had changed about the debt ceiling crisis, right? I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we might act, we might actually do it. You know, we might default, right? Whoever it is, whatever political party you don't like, just pretend that they become jerks about it and, and we don't do it. Of course, I know now the market comes raging back. We get a deal this weekend. Shocker, we don't go up anymore because the market had already priced it in. As long as you write about that part. But was there this like 5% chance in here that the market was going to just, the bottom was going to fall out? And the and it, was there that possibility? Yeah, yeah, there was. There was that possibility. Did I make the right decision? I don't know. You might be watching this a month from now or a year from now. You know the answer about whether I made the right decision. The the question that I proposed earlier, this like, you know, would any of my clients be willing to give up two to five percent gains in order to prevent a 50% downturn? The problem is that we have to make that decision like every day. Every week, right? If you go back a couple of months ago, we had the banking crisis. That's what these dips are. This is the banking crisis, right? This is May, late April, early May, or maybe it was in here. I I think it was in through here. (laughs) And then this is like the repeat of like the Pac West and stuff. So this is the banking crisis. Uh, We didn't know if that was the start of 2008. And yet we've come back, you know, from here, we've come back pretty darn well, a couple of percentage up. Before that, it was something else, and before that, it was something else. The problem is that we cannot predict what it is going, when it is going to be, and what it's going to be. And the the best example I can give of that is COVID. This is the COVID downturn right here. And this downturn doesn't look that nasty on this chart. I think it was thirty five percent from the top to the bottom on the S and P. We can look that up, but. This right here, this is 
February. If you remember the time frame, U.S. cases had started to be reported in February, but it wasn't declared a pandemic until March, March 11th, actually. I looked it up right here on the, on the timeline. Um, so imagine, and I, there was a client that just really needed to, you know, they wanted to be in cash. Or this, so we did sell out and go to cash. I'll say how that turned out in a minute. Um, if you had sold right here, this is like the earliest, I think like, you know, right here is when we kind of realize, oh, this thing's, this is going to get, this is going to become a big deal. Like everyone's going to get this, right? This is going to go all, all over the world. And at this point in my head, I'm thinking, what's a worst case scenario? For me, the worst case scenario is this, is that 5% of the world's population dies. You know, the epidemiologist, Mike, I'm not an epidemiologist, but everyone was at this point. I like that's in my head. Worst case scenario, five percent of the world's population dies. What what does that mean to the economy? I have no clue, right? But my guess is it's really bad, right? Because I've read uh, quite a bit. I listen to Hardcore History. Does one on the bubonic plague, where like ten percent of Europe's population dies in places, and it devastates the economy. Obviously, medieval Europe is very different than modern society. But if five percent of the world's population died, it would be a big deal, right? The markets would would get devastated would they come back yeah i don't think this is like independence day scenario but i don't want to be there if five percent of the world's population dies of course we know later it doesn't not only does that not happen but markets absolutely rage this year right they opened at 3200 they end at 3756 they're 20 percent for the year and if you get out of the market in the middle of March because you think COVID is going to ravage the world, I'll tell you what, you're not getting back in in May, right? <laughs> this is when it was just starting, May, June, July. This is when the world was losing its mind, where everyone is fighting about masks and like what's going to happen and the you know, mortality rates. The news through this entire stock market, you know, this entire climb is all terrible. This is all like, you know, we've got daily counts of how many people are dying. There's no way you think that this is sticking through. Not only that, but look at this number, right? So let's say you get out here. Are you going to get back in at the end of 2021 when it's 3756? We see this major climb. You think like, now the pandemic is it hasn't caught up. Maybe you actually know the future at this point, right? And you're thinking, okay, like the supply chain is going to fall apart at some point. It does in a year, right? Let's look at that number again. 37.56, the end of the year. The absolute lowest that we hit was only 35.85, meaning the whole next year in decline just barely put us below where we ended at the end of COVID. So if you thought this was unsustainable, well, guess what? The most recent recession put us like I don't know, a couple of percentages lower than where we were at the end of that year. We still had another year of raging, and then the recession largely took that away. Right? This is not something you can try and predict, right? If you had missed, even if you got out at the very top, somehow in February 15th, you could predict the future and you know that the economy is going to drop, you know, not the economy, the stock market should drop 35%. You're going to tell me you're going to get back in in August? I, I don't, I just don't buy it. Right. <laughs> and if you, even if you got out then and didn't get back in until the end of the year after watching the stock market rage for six straight months, you'd be out 15%. It's, it's just a huge deal. There's no way you could have predicted that this is what the stock market was going to do, just like you couldn't have predicted what it's going to do through this debt ceiling thing, the bank thing. Anything like right, like all through this, we're talking about this recession. This is a recession that I'm convinced is the recession that will never be, right? Record low unemployment through all of this. Profits are doing fine, not great, but fine. We went through, you know, there's a land war in Europe going on right now. That's one of the reasons we, you know, some of this and gas prices doing what it's doing. We had no idea whether it's going to be going down or up through all of this. You look at the max. This looks very convincing that we were too high, right? Oftentimes, when I talk with clients now about what happened last year, the recession, everything, they say, it's not that we're actually down that much. It's that this was way too high. Now, it's luckily for me that I've been working with most of these clients since 
back here, right? So we have lots of good years of growth in there. And it's not that we're down that much from the peak. It's that the peak was just unreasonable. You say, okay, well, how couldn't, why couldn't you predict that that peak was unreasonable? Well, I'll point from 2008 until that peak, which is when you're back in the 2017s, 18s, 19s, right? I remember all this as an advisor. This, this trend here didn't look reasonable. And the, the, the discussion always was, when is the, when is the floor going to fall out of this, right? We've been, we come through the 2008 global financial crisis, which is right on the heels of this, which is the um, dot-com bubble, right? The tech bubble bursting in the early days of the internet. When's the bottom going to fall out of this? We thought maybe it did here in kind of 2018, 2019. We actually have a negative year of returns there. We continue to crush it. We go through COVID. We continue to crush it, right? There is nothing but pessimistic news through all of this. And honestly, from since the you know, beginning of time, the doomsdayers have been saying the collapse of Western society is upon us. and It's just a matter of time. Well, you know, eventually, they're probably going to be right. But if you were getting out of the market and missing all these incredible returns, you needed them because of the lost decade and the 2008 global financial crisis right here, right? Like, it is the long-term game, right? So I, going back to that question, you know, none of my clients would answer that they're not willing to give up 2 to 5% of possible growth to, to avoid a negative 50%. The better question is over the 30 year investing period of your life or substantially longer for most people. Are you willing to give up seven and a half percent annual returns to make sure that you never decrease total account value by 50% at any one time? Are you willing to give up the market returns, the average market returns in order to avoid that decrease? Some people do say that and they're just not fit out for investing. But this idea that we're going to dodge downturns, that we're going to somehow make a smart decision with all, you know, with everything that we know in order to avoid a downturn, you don't understand how often we have to make that decision in the investing world. And I've had clients say, like, well, you know, can't you, isn't that why we pay you? Isn't like the whole reason you're so well informed? You, you know what's going on in the world. Can't you make a smart decision and predict what you think the market's going to do for us? And my answer, which is a tough answer, is, yeah, I can do that. I can you know, take everything I know and, and I can predict what I think is going to happen. But you should not listen to me if that's what I'm going to do. Because the simple truth is if I could do that, little old Michael Canavan here in southeastern Idaho, if I could even beat the S&P 500 reliably by 2%, I would not be an independent financial advisor. I'd be running the biggest investment firm in the world because that's the holy grail of investing. If you can manage that, right? And I often, there's an old statistic, this statistic's three, four years out of date, but back in like 2019, there was a statistic that 19 of the past 20 years, the stock market has declined at any one point during the year, seven and a half percent. Every single year, the stock market goes through a seven and a half percent decline from peak to trough. 19 out of the you know previous 20 years it had happened. Which means, imagine if I could just predict one of those a third of the time, right? I could dodge a third of those seven and a half. That figures out, that's what it is. You know, that figures out to probably about 2% that you're going to eventually beat the S&P 500. If I could reliably do that, it, it's the holy grail of investing. So anyone who's trying to convince you that they can do it, it just, I, it just, I just don't believe it, right? They, they would be making money hand over fist through this magic, right? If, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Often people ask me, you know, I want to make sure that during the down years, my accounts are safe. And I, you know, we go through the strategy and I talk. And, I say, and, then, and then I turn the question around and I say, what do you want to happen during the good years when the market's up? And the answer is almost always 
well, you know, well, my accounts to be up, you know, close to what the S&P 500 is. And I tell them, unfortunately, the reality, the truth is that I can't do both. I can't ensure that your account isn't going to go down in the, the bad years and make sure that it's going to, you know, be close to the S&P 500 in the good years. We have to find some compromise in between. I just can't do both. And, that, and that's the reality of the situation. So I, I could draw on about this. We're going to do, I can do more of these videos when scenarios like this come up. So I don't have an answer for this question. When do you go to cash? Because I think the answer never is a garbage answer too, right? When are, when would you put my account in cash? I have discretion for most of my accounts, which means I don't actually have to talk to my clients when I buy and sell their account. But when would it be? I don't know. I can tell you Independence Day. The aliens show up and they're shooting guns, moving accounts to cash. <laughs> Global pandemics, debt crises, banking system failures, doomsdayers telling me, you know, that the, the end is near. I don't have an answer, but I think about it almost daily, if not weekly. So um, maybe I will have the answer for you. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you soon.